I've treated hundreds of patients and trained thousands of healthcare professionals over my 15 year career. And one thing I've learned through that experience is that most people are really confused about supplements or they lack a clear strategy or plan for how to use supplements to improve their health. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line designed to add back in what the modern world has squeezed out and help you feel and perform your best. Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients we need for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. I formulated Adapt Naturals using the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research to fill the nutrient gaps that we face today and replicate the nutrient intakes found in an optimal ancestral diet. Our flagship offering is called the Core Plus Bundle, a daily stack of five products that gives you everything you need each day, from essential vitamins and minerals like B12, folate, magnesium, and vitamin D, to phytonutrients like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, and beta-glucans. You can also order the products in the bundle separately if that works better for your needs. The Adapt Naturals products are made from the highest quality, food-based, or bioidentical ingredients. From cellular and immune health, to brain and nervous system support, to blood sugar and heart health, we've got you covered. Your supplement cupboard is about to get a lot smaller. We also created an app called Core Reset to help you get your nutrition, sleep, movement, and stress management dialed in. Because no matter how good our supplements are, and they are really good, you can't supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. The best part is that you get this app at no additional cost when you order the Core Plus bundle. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everybody, Chris Kresser here. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you've been following my work for any length of time, you know I've been a huge advocate of bone broth for many years. It's been a part of traditional diets all over the world, and it has a profound impact on gut health and many other aspects of our health and well-being. But until really the last few years, there wasn't a ton of research on the nutrient value and content of bone broth, uh, questions about heavy metal toxicity, and ways that we could use bone broth to improve our health. And fortunately, that's changed in the past few years, predominantly from uh, research by Dr. Kara Fitzgerald and Jill Shepard Davenport, who are going to be my guests on this show. We've worked together over the years to address this question of the healing benefits of bone broth, and they are experts on this topic and have written a new cookbook, actually, on how to use bone broth effectively in your diet, how to use it as a base uh, when you're cooking, how to boost the nutrient value with herbs and spices, mushrooms, and other nutrient-dense foods. And I think this is really the missing piece for how to successfully incorporate bone broth into your day-to-day approach. It's, It's one of the things that I always recommend to all my patients. It's one of the things that can make the biggest difference in our health and well-being. And it's, it's so easy once you get it down. So really excited about this conversation. I think it's going to clear up a lot of misconceptions about bone broth, provide a lot more detail about how it can help, and then give you some really practical suggestions about uh, how to use it in your day-to-day cooking and approach to food. So without further ado, let's dive in. Cara and Jill, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be with you again, Chris. Thanks. Glad to be here. It's always a pleasure. So we're all big fans of bone broth. (laughs) You know, this is something when I first got interested in this field, even before I became a clinician, it was through the Weston A. Price Foundation, Nourishing Traditions. And as you both know, they're huge advocates of bone broth. And that was a big part of my gut healing and my recovery from my, my, the chronic illness that I struggle with. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of research available. It was more, you know, a, a, a traditional medicinal food that, that we knew that was present in a lot of cultures. And, you know, of course, grandma's chickens, <laughs> grandma's wisdom. But there wasn't a lot of research behind it. So I'm really excited to dig in 
to this topic in more detail because I know you've both done exhaustive research on the healing benefits of bone broth and the nutrients that it contains um, and how that can help to improve our health and, and longevity, uh, which is, of course, a particular interest of yours, Dr. Fitzgerald. So, yeah, maybe uh, we can start with the, b the backstory. Like, how did, how did you guys come to this interest in broth and its healing effects? Let me start, and then I'm going to just pass it right over to Jill to, um, to add to it. But um, of course, I'm a naturopathic physician by training, Chris. So just as, you're, as you elegantly stated, it, there's a long, massive traditional use history, especially in naturopathic medicine. So it was, you know, it was part of the core curriculum of my, of my training in, in medical school. And then, yeah, grew up with, with broths with a mom who, who, who really understood the benefit. We, of course, prescribed them, you know, we were using them in, in practice uh, forever, and the nutrition team was using them. For me, I think what started this journey was doing a roundtable. It was a QA at actually at Jill's alma mater, the, um, it's the Maryland School of Integrative Medicine. Is that the is yeah, the, Maryland University of Integrative, of integrative Health. Medicine, of integrative Health. Okay, sorry about that. So we were doing a QA. Um, during a great conference that they hosted. And I was on the stage with Deanna Minnick and a couple of other folks. And Deanna just sort of threw out this teaser question of, are we over prescribing bone broth? I mean, is it loaded with toxic metals? She threw this teaser question out and I was stopped. I mean, I didn't have the answer. And I knew we were using it all the time. And of course, you know, our thinking is yes, and we're over prescribing it and bones are loaded with lead and this is a really horrible thing. And it was scary. And I, you know, and I came back to the clinic and we have, our clinic is, is a deeply educationally focused place and we've got multiple rounds meetings, um, but the big rounds, our weekly rounds is with our nutritionists as well as our physicians and, you know, people jump in who are, who are who physicians who are training and nutritionists in training. And so it's this big awesome, lively discussion where we really kick around best practices. I mean, a lot of what we've done here is really kind of birthed in this discussion time that we have. And so I, you know, we, and we kind of educate each other, you know, it's like a village keeps each other current in the literature. And so I came home from this conference and was giving everybody a brief on it. And I said, Deanna Minnick posed this pretty extraordinary and provocative question that really needs to be answered. And I wanted us to take it on. I mean, I, I said, I'll, I'll absolutely, you know, fund looking at bone broths. Like we have to do it. We can't just prescribe this to our patients without answering this question. And really there was a dearth of literature. And so Jill decided to take it on. D Jill took it on. I think at the time you were just finishing your training with us. She did her, her hours, her, her CNS hours with us. Maybe you are already a full nutritionist in the clinic, but she totally took this on and worked with other nutritionists to begin the investigation. And so anyway, Jill, let me kick it over to you. And it's kind of a long, it's a long story, but it's sort of cool, but go ahead. Yeah, well, I have to say, uh, I was interested in the answer, but it was also just a tiny bit selfish, if I'm honest, because there were all these wonderful bones that I've been making broth with in my freezer. And I opened the door after that conference and thought, what, you know, what are we doing here? So I needed to know the answer just as much as everybody. Yeah. So with your support and your enthusiasm, we launched this bone broth pilot study. Um, so what we, and you know, the bone broth pilot study, and I'll get into the results in a minute, if that's of interest here, um, but it was key to the origin story of uh, the new cookbook, the new food is medicine cookbook that Dr. Fitzgerald and I just released this past November, because the results were so great and fantastic. Um, and we really conducted this kind of A to Z, full, complete look, not only at is there lead in, in bone broths, are there other toxic metals, but we looked at um, 19 different toxic metals and just a whole list uh, of, of minerals as well. And because the results were so great, as I said, we kind of got this inspiration with full confidence to launch into taking broths to new places to create healing recipes. Great. Yeah. Let's dive into that study and the results because I remember this controversy. I wrote about it several years ago and my t conclusion was 
you know, pretty much the same as yours, which is lead is, is not really a, an issue um, in bone broth in the levels that it's typically found. And, you know, I think it's probably worth mentioning with Prop 65, especially in California, and, and you're seeing Prop 65 labels on just about anything, including restaurants, <laughs> before you walk into a restaurant, it, that people understand that it's not unusual, and in fact, it's quite normal to see very low levels of heavy metals in a variety of different foods, and that that's just because heavy metals are naturally found in the soil. So the, the dose makes the poison. and. Right. Uh, I just think it's important to point that out because I think some people have the, the misapprehension that, you know, you can find, you, we should be able to find foods that have zero levels of, of lead or other metals. That's just not the way it works. Those are naturally found in, in our, in, on the earth and, and in the soil. So I'll, I'll just want to preface it with that. And let me just underline it by saying we've evolved, we've, we, our bodies evolved with exposure to these particular toxins. They know what to do. You know, we know our liver knows how to handle it. Our gut knows how to handle it. Obviously, if we're overwhelmed with it, you know, if our house is loaded up with lead paint, I mean, toxicity can definitely be achieved. So our bodies aren't used to an overwhelming amount. But yeah, we were designed to metabolize these, unlike, you know, some of the synthetic modern toxins, which our bodies, right. you know, they're just... And, and that's true for all plant comp, compounds in plants. You know, the, the carnivore argument is that there are toxins in plants. Well, yeah. big, big deal. <laughs> you know, we've been, th those actually upregulate our endogenous antioxidant defense system and they can be beneficial. That's a whole nother rabbit hole we're going, we're going to right now. But the other thing I wanted to mention too, so you can address it or we can just talk about it, is the importance of nutrient synergy. Because when these metals are present, in food, there are also other nutrients that are typically present in those foods that have been, that actually can help us to either detoxify those nutrients or prevent us from absorbing, or yes. excuse me, the, the metals. So calcium is an example, iron's an example, vitamin D, vitamin mm -hmm. C, and thiamine have all been shown to have a protective effect against lead toxicity. So none of right. this is happening in isolation, right? Right. Well, and, you know, the other thing, because, of course, Chris, you certainly read the recent consumer reports looking at chocolate and finding loads of lead and other other toxins um, or cadmium, I think, primarily. Cadmium, yeah. You know, we, 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 we just, you know, you do a periodic blood test. I mean, in, it's, it's covered by insurance. It's something that we should be looking at anyway. It, it should be just a part of a standard workup. And and then, you know, chances are you're you're good. Or if you're not, you just move into to handling it and get on with life. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a mountain out of a molehill mole, mole in most circumstances. But Jill, yeah, tell us a little bit about what you learned in the study, both in terms of lead content in broth and whether that's anything to be concerned about, and then what else you found in broth. Yeah, sure. And you know, uh, Chris, I really appreciate that blog post you, you did on lead um, those years ago. And that that was a nice starting off point for us. And it's linked in our study uh, as well, if folks are looking for the link. And um, that point about competitive inhibition, we do address it in the study as well. And that is why it was so important for us, really for the first time to our knowledge, to completely look at 36 other toxic and essential minerals and metals besides lead. So we could figure out what's in there and what amounts so that that synergistic effect that you pointed out, we could see how much of it uh, was at play. So what did we do? What did we found, find out? We sent in four samples to a lab, um, the same lab that we would use to look at uh, toxic uh, metals and essential minerals in clients that we work with. Uh, so we work with doctors' data, and the first sample was store-bought beef broth. This was from a great brand, Kettle and Fire, which just as an aside, when I don't have time to make my own broth, uh, I really, really like that brand. It's a good quality and made well. So we sent that one in, uh, made from organic and grass-fed beef bones. Then the second was a homemade 
beef broth. This was made from the bones in my freezer, <laughs> bones from grass-fed and organically raised cows sourced fresh from, from a farm in Maryland. Um, and just kind of quick shout out to local farms and, and ranches who make these available and affordable, just so super appreciative. And then uh, third is homemade beef broth from conventionally raised cows. So just bones purchased off the shelf at a very standard grocery store in DC. And then because collagen powder is so frequently used by folks as an alternative to cooking with bone broth, that kind of thing, the fourth was hydrolyzed beef collagen powder from the, grand, from the brand Great Lakes Wellness. And that's derived from pasture-raised grass-fed cows. So we sent these four in as a pilot study to check out, as I said, lead along with 36 other toxic and essential uh, minerals and metals. And uh, just to cut to the chase here of the 19 toxic metals that we tested for, including lead, all were either non-existent or just far below our concern threshold. And the limits that we looked at to create our threshold was pretty much everywhere possible. So we looked at FDA, EPA, USDA, American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, just every kind of way to analyze this to determine um, that lead, in addition to toxic metals, really wasn't a concern in any of our samples. So that means, you know, off the shelf, super standard, non-organic. You do have to give your little anecdote around how, how that, that you were able to actually smell the difference between those bone qualities. But I just yeah. think that that's really, that's heartening because there was a time, you know, depending on where you were, that there was, you know, if you were, if you were in, in, in a, you know, a polluted leaded gasoline area, if the cows were grazing there, then they would have a burden. And so, you know, I think, I think it's, it's nice to see that we've, that we're, we're, we're past that, or it's not yes. an issue. Yeah, absolutely. And so are we saying that when folks, well, one, you know, we, we've seen both broth together. I think all three of us here just do great things for people's health, gut health, and a variety of other uh, benefits, we, which we can talk about if that's helpful to recap for, for folks. The other thing is knowing that this is only looking at the, the metals, the metals, the minerals, and the uh, metallotoxins. So for this study, it was honestly the first time that I used conventionally raised bone, you know, bones from conventionally raised cows to make broth. And there was a noticeable difference in the way it, the, the aroma filled my house. <laughs> um, it just, it didn't smell great. So that, that's just kind of a, you know, off the cuff sort of observation. But that's an understatement and then, though. She, she's more colorful. <laughs> she is more colorful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's horrible. I've heard that before. Um, I mean, we've only ever made broth with, you know, past bones from pasture raised animals, but I have heard from some of my patients when, you know, they bought some bones w that weren't available, you know, or they couldn't get, they didn't have access to pasture raised bones and they use conventional bones that it, it tastes, smelled and tasted very different. Yeah. Yeah. So right, right, right there with you. It was very much a surprise. So you know, just reminding folks that, of course, this wasn't taking into account pesticides, antibiotics, or other kind of chemical or toxic exposures there. So not much lead or not, not an amount of lead to be concerned with. What about other nu micronutrients or other nutrients in general? So I, I found, you know, over the years that there are some misconceptions about nutrients in bone broth. For example, some people might think that bone broth is very high in calcium because after all it's made from bones right and bones contain calcium but at least i'm curious to hear what your data found but in in my you know from the previous study uh, research that i had seen there's actually not very much calcium in bone broth but it's of course rich in other nutrients that are beneficial yeah yeah absolutely so our samples found bone broth it's a great source of potassium Actually, I think it was more than more in one cup than in a banana or an avocado. So um, a very good source of selenium. Uh, so great thinking about. I'm just going to break in here and say that's really relevant because the Linus Pauling Institute says 100 percent of Americans don't get enough potassium. And I know this yeah. is a focus of, of yours, Kara, yeah. like the pota sodium potassium ratio is so far is one of the it's biggest mismatches in the modern world relative to ancestral diets. Right, right, right. Relative to every other mammal. I mean, it's kind of yeah. extraordinary that we just, 
it's we've completely flipped it. Yeah. Yeah, so let's put bone broth on, on the map for potassium repletion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's also, according to our samples in our pilot study, a great source of selenium. So, you know, thinking about it as a nice source for folks who are low in that and supporting their thyroid health. It also provides some magnesium, some calcium, though, as you mentioned, when we compared calcium to our daily needs, it, it does contain less calcium than, than we would have thought. So uh, not, not considering it to be, while it's a very good multivitamin mineral, you know, not, not a complete source. Right. And then can you talk a little bit about collagen and glycine and, and the role that they play? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So, so bone broth, contains a large amount of glycine, uh, which is a key amino acid in collagen, which gives bone broth when refrigerated, if we were lucky enough to make it well, um, that nice sort of jiggly uh, gelatinous effect uh, when chilled. And glycine is terrific for all sorts of things, but you know, one, one aspect that I tend to emphasize in my practice is that glycine is it's mood calming and it's sleep supporting. And so I'm using, for instance, our lavender infused uh, bone broth tonic to support people for sleep and, you know, getting really nice feedback there. And glycine's also balancing blood sugar and, and help or supporting too by improving insulin resistance and, because it's one of the three amino acids that we need to make glutathione, along with cysteine and glutamic acid, we can think of, of this as a nice source to support that detoxification as well. And, you know, there, I think glycine gets kind of superstar status when we think about what the amino acid components are in collagen and then are in bone broth, but there's a good amount of arginine, which helps protect against infection. And then, of course, those glycosaminoglycans great for joint health. So that's a mouthful kind of, of, of these wonderful amino acids and, and carbohydrates that are so supportive for our health. And uh, I like to think of those things when every time I'm taking a sip of bone broth, because I think our thoughts matter too. It's about everything we ingest. If we want to just, I would say that you did an awesome rundown. The only thing that I would add is that it's essential in our you know, in the whole methylation journey and actually making us adenosyl methionine and yeah. methylating folate itself. So yeah, I was going to mention there. that. And then also, you know, we talked about sodium potassium ratio being flipped. I would also argue that the meth methionine glycine ratio has been flipped or distorted in, in the, in the modern diet where you have many people just eating predominantly lean lean proteins that are high in methionine and, and not eating much of the collagen or glycine rich protein sources like bone broth or the gelatinous cuts of meat like oxtail or chuck roast or things like that. And when you look at ancestral diets, there was a much, much more of a balance between methionine and glycine intake. And my you know, one of my theories about, it's not just my theory, but a theory that I subscribe to when you look at studies that show a relationship between protein intake and cancer, uh, like some of like uh, the, the China study and T. Colin Campbell, generally, if, you, if, if that data stratifies intake of methionine and other amino acids, you, you really only see a relationship with very high methionine intake, not balanced by glycine and not balanced by any of the other nutrients that promote methylation like B12, folate, B6, et cetera. That's so interesting. This is the, the nuance <laughs> that is often left out of the claims made about protein. And another reason why I think bone broth and just collagen and glycine in general are really important additions to the diet for most people. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy to use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. 
Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. Paleo Valley's beef sticks are definitely one of my favorite snacks. They're unlike anything else on the market. They're made from 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef and organic spices, and they are naturally fermented, which gives them this really amazing flavor. In fact, they were recently voted in Paleo Magazine as one of the top snacks of the year. One reason I love Paleo Valley is that they're committed to making the highest quality whole food products that are free of junk ingredients. They're compact and easy to take on the go, especially when I'm out in the mountains and away from civilization. Go to paleovalley.com slash chris and use the code CRESSER15 to get 15% off. To live your healthiest, longest life, you need to understand what's going on inside your body. People age at different speeds, and generic annual blood work doesn't properly evaluate your biological age, but Inside Tracker does. Inside Tracker is a truly personalized nutrition and performance system designed to extend your health span and slow the aging process. Created by leading scientists in aging, genetics, and biometrics, Inside Tracker analyzes your blood, DNA, and fitness tracking data to identify where you're optimized and where you're not. You'll get a daily action plan with personalized guidance on the right exercise, nutrition, and supplementation for your body. Add inner age 2.0 to any plan to calculate your true biological age and see how you're aging from the inside out. For a limited time, get 20% off the entire Inside Tracker store. Just go to insidetracker.com forward slash Chris Cresser. That's insidetracker.com forward slash Chris Cresser. All right. So um, t- let's talk a little bit more about some of the broth recipes because I think the interesting thing to me about it is not just the broth, which is ob- an important, is the base or the foundation, but how you approach boosting, if you will, the nutritional value of the the broth recipes using things like mushrooms, which I'm, I'm also a big fan of, and spices, which we know are some of the most nutrient-dense foods available on an ounce-for-ounce ounce basis. And, and things like that, because I think that's where this gets really interesting and you can really make yeah. a superfood out of these uh, broth based recipes. Let me, I want Jill to, to just to go into the really super brilliant design of the book with, um, but I do want to, I want to give a shout out sort of back up to our research and also give another shout out to Jill being uh, supported by I- IFM and presenting this content um, at the annual international conference. I think what it was back in 2018, you did which was which was really fabulous they were very supportive of this work in fact you know anybody i think we had many many downloads for this document because everybody wants to know that their you know that their food is safe but yes i think she came up with a pretty brilliant structure to design it and um, concurrent to that was our our study looking at um, epinutrients looking at biological age and and, and dna methylation and gene expression etc and this a remarkable collection of epinutrients. And so as you're talking, Jill, you can just point out some of those nutrients that you layered into the structure. So taking it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Well, thank you both. You know, I have to say it was a lot of fun to figure out how to use bone broth and then use your research, Dr. Fitzgerald, with the Younger You program supporting uh, healthy genetic expression. It was a lot of fun to think about, all right, how to take all this great information and make it actionable, you know? I mean, I'm totally that person who will take a cookbook to bed at night and just sort of read the blurbs and flip through. And in the morning, just grab my same old kind of apple and almond butter sort of thing. So part of this book is really intended to inspire and make it easy and doable and action oriented, as well as of course, to educate. So as a brief overview to how this book kind of sets you, you know, the the listeners, the, the readers up, Um, Each recipe purposefully incorporates 
uh, that the nutrients that Dr. Fitzgerald has studied thoroughly and just discussed. So using methyl donors and DNA methylation adaptogens just as much as possible to promote that healthy longevity and that healthy epigenetic expression so that we can avoid aging into disease and also benefit this huge, vast field backed by scientific evidence uh, known as food as medicine. So we list those donors and adaptogens at the top in addition to other health benefits. And there's this heavy emphasis throughout the book. You know, we talk about it as a bone broth book. You can also, by the way, make the recipes vegan, vegetarian, or plant forward, plant based using plant based broths purposefully, right? Because we want all of these healthy nutrients in our diet. And there's a heavy emphasis throughout on the use of epinutrients like polyphenols, you know, which are, of course, this powerful group of phytonutrients found in fruits and vegetables, spices, herbs, nuts, and seeds uh, that are the center of younger you and better broths. So almost all of our recipes start with the broth. You can use bone, uh, any type of bones that you like. You can use a plant-based you can use a mushroom broth, which we did, which we crafted purposefully to help people get more mushrooms in their diet for all of the many, many supportive uh, effects they have on epigenetics, on immune health, on lipids, on so many things. So you start with a broth. And then, Chris, as you mentioned, we created this boost system. So we kept things simple. And then you boost it if you have time and interest by throwing in smart combinations of uh, herbs and spices and mushrooms that have a certain effect. So for instance, our Younger You Longevity Boost is mushroom, rosemary, and garlic. And there are others that support inflammation and, uh, and a variety of other uh, health effects. So you make a broth or two, you boost it, and then you use these broths as your base to make really healthy, nutrient-rich, nutrient-dense recipes all week. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think I want to like dive into that a little bit more because I think sometimes when people think about bone broth, they're like, okay, soup, <laughs> you know, like that, that's it. Uh, I'll, I'll have soup once a week um, or, or make a bone broth based soup, but there's so many other ways that you can use broth. So let, let's dive into some of those. Cause I'm sure I know you expand well beyond the idea of soup Personally, we use it for sauces. Um, I'll, I'll drink it straight as a tea sometimes. Uh, we'll use it to cook. If we sometimes are cooking grains like rice, we'll use it to cook the, the rice in. So yeah, how about um, some, some of the maybe less conventional ideas for incorporating bone broth so that people are getting a little bit every day? Oh, okay. Um, and I love those ideas that, that you have, Chris. I think one of the neat things that we've came up that we've come up with are actually bone broth ice pops. Yes, I uh, said ice yes, pops, thinking dessert. Um, so we have a strawberries and cream, and we have uh, we have a couple different flavors. Thinking about folks who may not be drawn to bone broth, thinking about kiddos, we don't want to create this bone broth tug of war in any kitchens, you know. So Actually, with that desire in mind, we created, which I think is something that's really neat, we created a sort of a quote unquote sweet base broth, in addition to what you might think of as a more savory base broth. So this isn't sugary sweet and there's no added sweeteners in there, but we're using cinnamon, cloves, apple, orange peel, all modifiable, by the way, based on the unique sort of needs that someone may have for gut health, for instance. And it creates this nice sort of sweet-ish, lovely flavor profile. So it goes into the cookies, it goes into the, um, into the strawberries and cream ice pops. It goes into a whole variety of, I call them sort of like latte-ish drinks, tonics that we have. You can whip up and make sort of a warm, sweet-ish smoothie. Knowing that not everybody wants sort of a, a cooler smoothie, for instance, in the winter months when those might be harder to digest or chilling for the body. So just some examples. Um, we have, I think one of my favorite recipes in the book is our uh, mole negro recipe, which I love mole negro. I love Mexican food. I love Oaxacan food, which is the region where that came from. I lived with a Oaxacan chef for a while who just made the most magical mole. And I knew that we could build on this 
wisdom, this traditional wisdom and indigenous wisdom. Uh, and we, we looked at all of the nutrients and we compared it to this fantastic uh, appendix in Dr. Fitzgerald's book, uh, lining out foods and all of their epinutrients in there. And basically, <laughs> mole negro tastes great on everything and it is absolutely filled. I think we counted 36 uh, different DNA uh, supportive uh, nutrients in there and methylation adaptogens. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I love the pops, the broth pops idea. I mean, there's bacon flavored ice cream, so why not bone <laughs> broth flavored popsicles? Yeah, maybe you could combine the two bacon flavored bone broth pop popsicles. That would be a new one. <laughs> I want to just like, I want to just throw out as an aside for anybody who might be feeling a hint of overwhelm that these are all tested in our clinic practice where people haven't made bone broths for themselves or made, you know, layered on boosts and then used them in recipes. And like, if there's one thing that the nutrition team needs to be competent at is just holding the branch down so that anyone can do it and you can do it in within the context of a busy working household with kids, et cetera. And so please just know if you're listening and you haven't jumped into this world yet, you got it. You can do it. Like Jill lays it out super easy. Yeah. And I, I would say just having worked with thousands of patients and prescribed bone broth to virtually all of them like you, Kara, and, and many of those patients being kids or families and having my own kid and using bone broth and lots of recipes over a long period of time that, you know, it adds umami, which is uh, one of the key flavors and makes most things taste better. So I, I haven't found bone broth, especially when it's incorporated in other recipes, you know, using it as a base for sauces or cooking grains in it or, or, or even with soup. You know, our daughter is 11 and she still loves soup that's made with bone broth. So I, it, it might be intimidating and overwhelming at first, but I think in, in many cases, kids actually love it and, and find that it makes everything taste better. Yeah, you know, I some folks ask me, okay, Jill, so you're telling me this is going to make my life easier, but first I have to make a broth <laughs> and then I have to use it to cook something. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I promise, because it really does make things taste better. All of this deliciousness, and by the way, all these great nutrients and, you know, your water soluble zinc, selenium, vitamin B, you know, if you throw mushrooms in there, all of it's just jumping into your meals and adding flavor at the same time. So, it creates success and it makes things really quick to cook in the kitchen. Kind of, if you have broth and you have vegetables, the broth is infused with spices. If you use some of our and herbs, if you use some of our boosts, you throw it in a blender and it's kind of like done. And I hope it's empowering and inspiring to people. And I'll say this to your point, Dr. Fitzgerald, that you know, the entire front of the book, which are blends, which are kind of AKA warm smoothies, tonics and infusions, and many of our soups, and then all of our base broths and all of our base broths boosts. Uh, when I was creating with the team, I sort of gave the mission. I want all of these things to be able to be made in 10 minutes or less hands-on time. So the whole front of the book is for you. If you're like, ah, give me something to do in 10 minutes and I'll do it. We've got you. Yeah. I would say it's also just a question of how you think about your cooking time. You know, it's maybe a little front loading in the sense that it, it takes a bit of time to make the broth. But then once you have it, as you've pointed out, in, you know, you can just dip into it literally <laughs> throughout the week over and over again. It's not something you have. You're not going to be making broth every single day. Uh, in most cases, you're going to make it once a week and then just have access to it um, throughout the, the rest of the week, which like, like you said, Jill, I, I find it actually makes it easier to make good meals uh, rather than harder. Yeah. This is something that's totally prevalent in the, the highest level of cooking too. You go to any, you know, Michelin star restaurant, almost certainly they're using broth in a lot of their recipes. My wife recently, we, uh, we were at the library getting our daughter some books and we saw the, Ju the Julia Child's um, masterwork on French cooking 
and we picked up a copy of it and pretty much every recipe in there has broth it also has butter and <laughs> you know all of the good french stuff but you know this is something that that top chefs have been incorporating into their recipes for many years so it, it it's not only healthy it's delicious and and will elevate you as a cook so let me throw this out there because I can, I just hear it. I have a, I hear it in my head, the din. People are listening to this and saying, but I'm histamine intolerant. Uh -huh, right. And so yeah. I just, I want to hear both of your thoughts. I mean, I know you've addressed it, Jill, in the book, but I just, I know Chris, you'll be, you'll have some thinking on it as well. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I've covered this so many different ways. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you have, have uh, your approach, Jill, and then I can chime in and tell you what I think. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, folks who have histamine overload or maybe mast cell activation syndrome or some kind of combination or sort of allergy activation or things like that, there's there's a lot more, of course, that we do to get to the root cause so their body can handle the histamine that it's producing, um, can degrade it and maybe not produce amounts that you know, that may lead to intolerance, for example. So knowing that food is just sort of one piece of a full sort of functional medicine and nutrition approach for building tolerance. And I, I have worked with people who, who do suffer. And, you know, at first I really didn't know quite much, what, what, quite what to make of histamine intolerance. And over time I began to really, really respect what people were experiencing and, and the response that they were having in this book. We do have a way to make broth that is lower, pretty darn low in, in histamine, I would imagine, because histamine is in part uh, created through a bacterial conversion, histidine through histamine requiring bacteria. And so if we cook it quickly, like pressure cooking, and if we are freezing it quickly, you know, that also helps. Uh, and then it also helps to use sort of meat on the bones. And so we do a kind of, we, we, we poach a chicken essentially. And we teach people how to do that in pressure, in a pressure cooker style. And that broth can then be used all throughout the book. So anyone who is on a low histamine diet, who is finding that beneficial, you know, you have a way to make nearly everything in the recipe, in, in the book from sweet to, to savory as well. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would also, you know, come back to the nutrient synergy uh, discussion that we had earlier. A lot of, I, I imagine, well, I know from seeing the book that a lot of the nu nutrients, other nutrients from uh, herbs and spices and things that you're including in some of the recipes can have an antihistamine or at least a histamine balancing mast cell supporting effect. So that even if someone was somewhat sensitive to the broth itself, it may be that the other nutrients uh, that are in those recipes are going to help balance that out. And look, you know, in my experience, this is just a highly individual thing, and it can even vary on a day to day basis where if we think of histamine as a threshold based intolerance, you know, depending on how f empty or full your cup is on that particular day or what else is going on in the background that might determine your response. But it's not something that you have to wait 30 days to find out about, you know, like you That's don't right. need to take a lab test and wait for the results and see, oh, did that cup of broth affect my, my, my histamine? You'll know. <laughs> That's yes. the, the nature of histamine intolerance is you'll know right away. You, you'll start developing some of the symptoms and you can manage your intake accordingly. And then of course, either on your own or with your functional medicine provider, keep working to address the underlying causes of histamine intolerance, which in my opinion, one of the big ones is poor methylation. <laughs> so you're, you're consuming all of these nutrients that are going to help your methylation long-term. That's actually going to reduce your histamine intolerance. And rebuild. Yeah, and rebuild the gut, which 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 is essential to develop cause to number two of histamine intolerance. Yeah. Right? yeah, and you know one of the one of the cool things that we've seen time and again is that those with histamine intolerance or other into sort of gut mediated intolerances almost uniformly can handle more foods and foods con combinations than they know, and then when you combine things carefully and when you use the structure for building the broth that Jill just outlined, 
people are routinely, you know, present, pleasantly surprised at, at what they're able to do with the caveat that, you know, some days are harder than others, as you said, but we're, we routinely expand people's diets, you know, and pretty rapidly because you do in fact know with an intolerance like that, if you're going to react, you know, immediately, you don't have to wait for a lab test. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's, that's something I'm a big fan of expanding people's diets rather than narrowing them and making them even more limited. And I mean, th this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's relevant, which, which is for me, I don't necessarily think that a, a minor reaction to eating something as you're trying to expand your diet is a problem. It's actually something that we may need to learn to tolerate as we expand our diet. And I see a, a, a trap that a lot of people fall into is if they have any kind of reaction whatsoever, they immediately stop eating that food and not and don't try to expand their diet. And that can really keep people stuck in a, in a very limited um, range of foods indefinitely. Because if you haven't been eating a food for a long time and then you start and you introduce it, your gut bacteria and your body in general just need to reacquaint themselves with that food, and that might produce a, a few symptoms. So it's not, I just try to caution people from seeing any, you know, any kind of negative reaction as, as a sign that you absolutely shouldn't be doing that, because I think that's the wrong approach. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that point. And, you know, if there's, you know, folks listening in who or on specialized healing diets. One, I mean, we do tailor the recipes and help you customize them to support you. However, two, you know, I took a tour through pretty much every kind of healing and specialized diet, you know, over the course of a decade, healing from my own various symptoms, gut health included. Uh, you know, everything from vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, dairy-free, low FODMAP, just everything, you name it. And I found that I was so focused on what to exclude, sort of in a fearful way or in a concerned way. I was so focused on what to exclude that I wasn't thinking about emphasizing what to include that could help shortcut sort of the finish line to my healing journey. And so truly, this book, uh, Better Broad, seeks to kind of write that wrong um, so that we can embrace this full, full, full circle of this large concept called food as medicine, um, not only maybe avoiding things for a short time, if necessary, that we don't tolerate, but, you know, running towards all the foods that can help us improve our health, our body function and our tolerance. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really important. And it's something I'm sure you've both witnessed in your work. This, you know, I think, not so much in the general population, but in our patient population, the people who are, I think, exposed to so much health information online and so many people who are very strident proponents of a particular <laughs> theory or approach. And if you were to add up AIP, carnivore, you know, paleo, low FODMAP, and you, you put all those restrictions together, you basically have you know, four or five foods left that, that can safely be eaten. And um, I think it's really Im important. I, I know you agree, Jill, because we worked together on this for a while. And I think you do too, Kara. Yeah. But just, oh, yeah. It, nutrient deficiency is already so common as it is that removing foods that are really nutrient dense just out of some idea that they might not be good for us, that's not tested by our actual experience or any laboratory Date, you know, supporting lab testing is not a good approach. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, yeah, the ortho, orthorexia is a real phenomena that we see in our patient population that we really have to aggressively correct. And, you know, there's, I'm just, I, I'm preparing my lecture slides for the IFM's immune module that I teach in. And one of the, my areas of focus this time is you know, developing a true allergy because you've been avoiding something for so long. And so your T, -reg, you know, your ability to tolerate, you know, your immune system's ability to recognize and tolerate something and know that it's okay and safe. Like we can, we can lose that. We can lose that ability under certain circumstances. Or not even establish it. I mean, this, this is how the, the, the guidelines are changing with kids, yeah. right? In terms yeah, of right. Or babies in terms of Massive. when you should reintroduce certain, yes. certain 
foods that can have an allergenic effect like egg yolks or eggs or think, you know, even gluten and wheat, that if you wait too long, then the you lose the window of, of tolerance. That's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know and it's this, extraordinary. This is of course also the idea between behind the hygiene hypothesis and the old friends hypothesis. And it is, it's like exposure to all kinds of antigens, you know, bacteria, microbes, it's why kids who grow up on farms typically have more robust immune systems than kids who grow up in really sterile environments. So yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, but bringing, bringing it back to, you know, where, when we went off on that, I think useful tangent <laughs> is that histamine bone broth. Yes. It's an issue for some people. If you have a little bit of a reaction to bone broth, in my opinion, that doesn't mean, oh no, no bone broth ever again for eternity. It means maybe just dial it back a little bit <laughs> the next time you do it, or just kind of like check in to see where you're at. Maybe on a day where you're feeling good and you haven't had a lot of foods that have histamine, you might be able to consume a little more. So don't freak out about it. Just, just you know, listen to your body and use that as your guide. Yeah. And if you like, you can use our lower histamine bone broth and then steep it and make our nettle infusion, which, uh, which Perfect. supports, yeah, which, which supports some um, histamine intolerance. You know, one thing that, that was running through my mind, listening to you both talk about the importance of variety, you know, all throughout the book, we stream phyto, you know, polyphenols, a type of phytochemical through. And we highlight these literally with a spotlight. Um, and we discuss how many of these are DNA methylation adaptogens and epigenetically active and pointing back to Dr. Fitzgerald's research with her Younger You program. And what I think is interesting is sometimes people ask me, all right, you know, if I sprinkle a little bit of this herb and a little bit of this spice and I infuse a cup of broth with a little bit of, you know, nutmeg or thyme or nettles, for example, you know, it's, it just looks like a sprinkle. Is this really going to do anything to support my health? Kind of AKA Jill, is it worth it? And what I like to share is that, you know, when it comes to these plant-based naturally arising chemicals, what the research has found is that when eaten in small doses consistently and from a lots of different food sources, so really honing in on getting that variety, it has a dramatic impact on health. Um, so one piece is how they're epigenetically active and folks can turn to Dr. Fitzgerald's and others research on that. And, you know, Thinking about how polyphenols can play an important role in cancer prevention, in part through epigenetic changes. And so, you know, understanding that most of the research outside of supplements on how food and different nutrients are impacting epigenetic expression towards cancer expression, it's in doses of these phytonutrients that are naturally found in foods. So it's literally these nutrients acting as medicine in foods. So the bottom line, I would say is yes, it definitely helps. Um, and I just encourage lots and lots of variety and frequency. And you know, I hope folks will see that impact on their health as I have for mine and so many people that I've worked with. Excellent. Well, I'm, I'm really excited about this book being out there, I think. A lot of people have heard about the benefits of bone broth for a long time, but they just haven't really figured out how to incorporate it into their diet on a regular basis and also how to, how to make interesting, you know, not just broth, like how to actually make interesting recipes that are broth based. And, you know, frankly, I think, like I said before, it really elevates your cul culinary game. If you can master the art of cooking with bone broth, everything that you eat is going to taste better and it's going to be better for you. So it's a win-win situation. Tell us where people can learn more about the book and pick up a copy. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to betterbroths.com and to learn more about how the book fits into the Younger You program, you can go to youngeryouprogram.com. And to learn more about what Dr. Fitzgerald and I are doing, uh, you can check out drkarafitzgerald.com or jillshepherddavenport.com. And the book is everywhere. It's so fun to get sort of pictures of my friends who are actually out and about and going into bookstores. So that's been really fun. Of course, it's available at big box retailers and online at Amazon. Um, the full title for those who are interested in checking it out 
or better broths and healing tonics, 75 bone broth and vegetarian based broth recipes for everyone by Dr. Fitzgerald and myself. Yay. So exciting. Congrats on <laughs> Thanks, this uh, phenomenal work. It's always a pleasure to talk to you both and look forward to seeing what's next. Awesome, Chris. Thanks so much for having you, having us again. And I just really appreciate you and your your depth of knowledge and interest in, in our work and support of our work. Well, you're very welcome. Thanks so much. Great to be here. Oh, thanks, Jill. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, keep sending your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. We'll see you next time. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.